The Dominant Strain by Edward H. Hurlbut. Samson, said Lanigan, there's something queer about that Robbins case. Professional second-story men aren't returning to the scene of a $10,000 burglary and sending by messenger a written proposition to return the property for a cash settlement. They know how and where to negotiate the stuff, and they take no chances, particularly not with one of their number under arrest, assuming the ward boy is one of them. And that is another queer angle. Seasoned crooks don't operate with sixteen-year-old boys. How do you account for the ring found on him? I don't, yet. What's your theory? Haven't any. But ten second-story cases in three months in one district winding up with a ten-thousand-dollar job is against all form. Dig into it, then. Here, see who this is as you go out. Maybe about the suspect. Same name. He handed Lanigan a visitor's card. Scrawled across it in a nervous hand was Jenny Ward, important. In the anteroom, a girl with a crutch arose to meet him, but he motioned her back to her seat. She had the pinched face and the wistful sadness of those condemned to life but half whole. It was evident before she spoke a dozen words that she came, as so many others come to the newspaper anteroom, in futile, uncomprehending protest at the entire system of news. It was her brother Jimmy who was under arrest, and she said he was innocent. Jimmy told her he found the ring, therefore he did find it, because Jimmy never told her a lie. She did not see why papers should print such things, even if he had been arrested, and why they did not try to prove a boy innocent rather than aid the police in trying to prove him guilty. Lanigan listened patiently at first with an occasional question, and then he listened with a deepening interest as the girl's fervor grew. "'It is only the rich whose wrongs you right,' she exclaimed at last passionately. "'What rights have we poor?' I cannot afford even a lawyer. Mama does washing. She is old and timid, and she was afraid to come to the papers. I mostly educated myself, sir. I had to. I have learned the piano at the Sunday school. I have a little class of pupils there. The teacher helps me get them. I just teach the first lessons, you know. I make four dollars and twenty-five cents a week. Mama makes about seven dollars when she is not sick. Jimmy has been making eight dollars with a raise to nine dollars and fifty cents coming the first. So you see, we manage to make out, all of us together, and send my three little brothers to school. And now, now, all the people on the street are talking about us, and my little brothers won't go to school. The others call them names. Everyone saw Jimmy's picture in your paper today. "'Won't you please help us? We haven't any men folks to fight for us now with Jimmy locked up. Please, sir, help us get Jimmy out.' I went to police headquarters and waited hours and hours to see Jimmy, and then, and then finally to the detectives, they took me and said I would see Jimmy, but they took me to a room and shut the door, and they swore at me. They said I better tell everything or go to jail. Why, why, they talked like I knew about the robbery, and they were going to arrest me. She fainted, just dropped quietly back into the chair, wearily, hopelessly, woefully, without so much as a sigh. Lanigan breathed quickly as he ministered to her. "'Poor little sis,' he said softly, "'plucky little mother of the tenements, taking a full-grown man's place. But what a handicap!' Her eyes opened. "'Oh!' she fluttered, her thin, sensitive lips quivering in apology. "'I, I fainted, d didn't I? How queer! I never fainted before.' I cannot afford to give way like that. Sometimes, though, oh, sometimes I wish I could. I wanted to in front of the detectives. My brain whirled and whirled and whirled with fire like pinwheels, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't give them the satisfaction. Her slight hands with their long fingers clenched. Her eyes sparkled. Harrigan, that is his name. He was the worst. The brute, Oh, if I were a man, I would kill him for what he said to me. Never mind, Harrigan, leave him to me, said Lanigan. You are only exciting yourself. Go home now and try not to worry. We are going to look into your brother's case. 
oh thank you she said with shining eyes there were at no time any tears she had been trained in a life where tears are inadequate lanagan watched her as she hobbled on her one crutch down the hall to the elevator her useless limb swinging loosely she was a pathetic little figure with her man's brain her grown woman's pride and her little misshapen body a fourteen-year-old girl wearing long clothes in grim earnest a quick pang shot through him cripples always saddened him they have infinitely so much less than the meanest wastrel who has health the judgment of a cold-blooded detective against the judgment of a loyal sister mused lanagan which is it an hour's study at police headquarters of the reports on all ten of the burglaries established in lanagan's mind one settled conviction they were all committed by the same author and whoever it was whether an individual or a gang had first become reasonably familiar with the interior arrangements of the houses entered and with the daily routine of the households in the robbins case for instance from the time the last member of the household left the bedrooms or second floor to go down to the dining room on the first floor for dinner until a member of the household returning upstairs found the evidences of the burglary only twenty-five minutes had passed and yet in that time the thief or thieves had entered the house and had left it after cleanly ransacking three bedrooms an open bathroom window and the drain pipe to the ground gave mute evidence of the burglar's route in all of the cases only precious stones were taken nothing monogrammed was touched nor watches silverware trinkets or bric-a-brac but this was of no particular consequence the average expert thief prefers the precious stones removed from their settings they are difficult to identify and easy to negotiate professional work all of it muttered lanagan arguing to himself but what about that message the extraordinary boldness that had marked all the crimes culminated in the robbins case when a man with smoked glasses heavy moustache soft hat pulled down and ulster turned up gave a small boy ten cents to carry an envelope to the robbins home but a block from where the man stood enclosed in the message which offered to return the jewelry for five thousand dollars cash was a brooch that had been among the articles stolen it was sent as proof that the offer was genuine the message said the police were not to be notified if the family desired to negotiate they were to send the boy back with the single word yes and they would be communicated with later in the excitement of receiving the message under such singular circumstances a member of the family forgetting or disregarding the caution telephoned the police holding the boy in the house the police misunderstood the call and a patrol wagon load of reserves clattered up to the door within ten minutes under the impression murder was being done naturally the man on the corner had ample time to escape no further offers to negotiate came to the family on the second day the police placed under arrest the ward boy he was employed as a helper with the phoenix vacuum cleaning company which had been engaged a few days before at the robbins home and at the start he made a bad case superficially by his contradictions reflected lanagan reviewing the case in their investigations the detectives examining the two men and the helper jimmy ward who had operated the cleaning apparatus at the robbins house learned that the boy had been noticed that morning examining a diamond ring asked where he got it he had replied he found it on the floor of the washroom at the establishment no one claimed the ring the matter was called to the attention of cutting the proprietor and manager of the company but he knew of no customer having reported such a loss the detectives harrigan and thomas took the boy to headquarters for further questioning and he had there said he found the ring on the sidewalk on that contradiction he was placed under arrest and locked up in detinue further the police regard as damaging the fact that a robbery a week previous had been committed in the same neighborhood in a home where the cleaning apparatus had been engaged the ward boy serving as the helper in that house also 
he had worked with a different crew of men than had been on the robbins house and this fact in the police theory eliminated the remaining employees of the company as it was highly improbable that they were all in a second-story ring they redoubled their efforts to find the supposed connections of ward on the theory that he operated with an outside gang jimmy said he found the ring and if he said he found it he did find it said lanagan repeating the sister's earnest declaration well for her sake i hope he did hour after hour lanagan tirelessly kept at his rounds visiting in turn each of the ten homes in the western edition that had been robbed during the last three months long before he reached the robbins home the last of the ten he had formed his startling theory in nine of the cases he had discovered that which he set out in search of a constant condition present in them all there was just one question that he wanted to ask at the robbins home he found the home in a flurry of excitement police headquarters had rung up and asked that a member of the household come at once to the detective bureau to identify if possible a bracelet that it was believed had been among the stolen articles and that had been recovered lanagan arriving just as the senior robbins was leaving in his automobile was invited to accompany him he did so but first he had asked and had answered the one question he came to ask in the office of o'rourke night captain of detectives they found o'rourke harrigan and thomas grouped around a woman huddled down in a chair lanagan caught a low sob a helpless forlorn frightened sob that sent a curious sensation of nausea through him he stepped quickly forward to gaze down upon the misery-racked form of the cripple jenny ward i don't know anything oh, i don't know anything she wailed i found it on the doorstep o'rourke had turned as they entered he stepped to his own desk holding the bracelet toward robbins that is my daughter's bracelet sirs robbins said it was my christmas present to her harrigan listening nodded in satisfaction i knew it he said i guess we had better throw the little gutter snipe in cap a little pressure now and she's bound to squeal oh oh, oh, oh. sobs were shuddering from the girl squeal you damned clodhopper give her a bullet and kill her now if you're trying to you don't throw her in it was lanagan he had whirled from the huddled form to send the words cutting through the air at harrigan like a whiplash the girl flung up a white face in a swift look of wild hope i don't know anything mr lanagan don't let him put me in jail she threw herself from her chair in an attempt to clasp his arm but her withered and shrunken limb crumpled under her and she sank to the floor with a sharp cry of pain lanagan leaned and lifted her to the chair harrigan had an ugly look as he measured the distance from himself to lanagan yes harrigan you rotten thief clodhopper is too mild for you you bum said harrigan with deadly levelness you drunken bum lanagan's leap was cat-like it took all the mighty o'rourke's strength to tear his fingers free lanagan was not a queensbury fighter when tackling two hundred pounds of policemen o'rourke had harrigan by the arms thomas had lanagan for a second or two there was not a sound but the panting of grappling men then discipline told harrigan's arms relaxed you are relieved from duty officer harrigan said o'rourke until i lay the matter of your insubordination before the chief the detective turned on his heel and walked from the room stopping at the door i'll get you lanagan he said lanagan ignored him now jack said o'rourke grimly as thomas freed the reporter why won't we throw this girl in because said lanagan still breathing heavily she is innocent how do you know i know that is enough if you won't take my word ring up the chief and he will o'rourke knew the close friendship between lanagan and chief leslie and the confidence the chief had in his judgment he gazed doubtfully at the girl and then at robbins secretly he respected lanagan also and he was impressed by lanagan's assurance we aren't justified in holding the girl he said to robbins then to lanagan all right you win 
but as lanagan left the room with the girl to send her home in the police automobile o'rourke had an afterthought he turned to thomas we might just as well cover up watch the house tonight there's something queer about this whole business that i don't get yet whatever happens keep calm until i see you again was lanagan's last counsel to the girl through the scene in o'rourke's office she had kept crouched down in her chair watching with wide eyes save for one quickly shrilled give it to him as lanagan's sinewy fingers twined around harrigan's throat it was terrible of me to say that wasn't it she asked but i couldn't help it he is a bad man i feel it he's what we call a wrong detective said lanagan dryly don't think about him any more let me have norton he said some moments later to sampson and to me he said i want you to cover two eleven clementina street don't bother anybody just see who goes in or out or hangs around there i'll pick you up later down there wait for me no matter what happens he jumped into a taxicab at the curbing and whirled away out market street i hastened to my station in that gloomy narrow street of rookeries almost opposite to eleven was a deep doorway i flattened back in the shadows trusting to luck that the occupants were all in bed and that no one would walk up on me i was not bothered an hour passed and another i heard someone come out of a house a few doors above me and saunter down the street toward me i huddled back the figure passed within six feet of me by the dim rays of the gas lamp on the corner throwing its feeble area of light a dozen yards i recognized detective thomas he slipped into the side door of the corner saloon off his job whatever it is i said to myself something should happen now it usually does in such cases it did noiselessly on the opposite sidewalk passed a figure in a heavy black overcoat with a high collar turned up around the ears and a soft hat pulled down in front of two eleven the figure stopped for a fraction of a second it may have been to look for something that had been dropped but it appeared to me to fumble an instant by the steps the figure then passed rapidly on thomas a fresh cigar between his teeth sauntered back to his post the figure that had stopped at two eleven had disappeared around the corner at seventh street thomas had certainly missed the episode entirely there was a long interval the door at two eleven opened slowly a girl came out finally a girl with a crutch she came down the three steps looked up and down and across the street and suddenly dropped down and i could see that she was rummaging in the space under the stairs stepping easily i saw thomas his cigar still puffing leisurely cross the street he was almost beside the girl before she saw him there came a faint cry of alarm quickly smothered as she straightened up her back to the house i walked quickly to them in time to hear thomas voice well miss find any presents little late for santa claus isn't it ah well, let's see uh, let's just see what you were looking for under those stairs he dropped to his knees threw his pocket flash about and arose a small package wrapped in a newspaper in his hand the girl was staring with startled wide eyes she was breathing quickly her thin bosom rising and falling thomas wheeled on me was about to snap at me thought better of it and remarked oh well you're dropped to me i might as well let you in he tore off the paper wrapping from the package, and in the flash of his pocket light I saw the glitter of a pair of diamond eardrops. "'Do you make them?' he asked triumphantly. I nodded. The jewels unquestionably answered the description of those stolen from the robin's home. It came to me like a physical blow, the shock that such a frail, broken bit of humanity as the little back alley waif before me was entangled in a thieves gang i knew she was the suspect's sister she still held her defiant place against the house i guess this time young lady you will go in said thomas tersely do you want anything from the house got anything to say you are going to jail she began to tremble violently but her lips were still compressed no 
she managed to say at last no i was watching i know now i know but i will not talk to you please don't waken my mamma or my little brothers let us go now if i must she started to hobble away in feverish haste shaken with sobs that she would not permit to escape her lips seldom have i been affected with such a sense of sadness as came over me then all of the tragedy that would have been in the situation with even a whole girl under such circumstances was doubled by her condition got her dead to rights that time chuckled thomas to me she'll spill now sure the rest of the stuff must be cached around here somewhere you think there is uh, no question about the ward boy i asked not the slightest and she is in and is covering up they're all crooked these back alley rats there's more in the gang of course that stuff was put there i suppose to-night for her to shove probably she peddles it you never can tell how these gangs operate i glanced again at the pitiable little misshapen thing dragged away from her home to a cell and an iron bed at the city prison and i couldn't trust myself to reply to thomas by a curious change that is gradually making me less valuable as a newspaper man the older i become in the business i find myself unconsciously taking sides against my paper with fellow beings whose frailties or sorrows make them grist for the newspaper mill i felt so toward this poor little girl now a victim of congenital influence in all likelihood obviously a product of the malnutrition of the under classes thomas took his prisoner away in a taxi and i hurried to a telephone and gave the story to sampson in that fashion i then hastened back to clementina street where to my great relief i was picked up by lanagan within a few moments i related everything to him when i had finished his eyes shone more brightly than the gas jet over our heads never had i beheld him so far from the composure for which he was noted for a minute or two he anathematized o'rourke by all the carded oaths and a few that he invented back back in jail is she so o'rourke couldn't take my word we'll see oh we'll see wait he ran up the steps to two eleven after a long period the door opened it was the mother briefly lanagan explained what had happened the poor old toothless soul was about past being shocked further but quickly lanagan in that compelling way of his calmed her fears he promised that she would have her son and daughter back before daylight before daylight it fairly took my breath away what is it jack give me a line i demanded in excitement heavens man it's a quarter to two how are you going to get a story in the paper tonight now you'll only break it for all the papers lanagan stopped short in his rapid walk and laid his hand on my shoulders i've been in this game fifteen years norrie he said with a solemnity new in him let me tell you something and i say it who have the right there comes a time just once every so often when a newspaper man puts humanity above his paper remember that you are betraying no trust with your paper when you do you are betraying your trust with yourself with your fellow man and with your conscience when you do not this is one of them that was all but many times in the years that have whirled by since then and since that strange marvellous man passed out of the newspaper life of the west have those words come back out of the dark of a back alley to guide me he was not working for an exclusive now he was working to free a mite of a crippled girl and her stunned and misused brother from the inner tier of cells at the city prison he said no more at market street he flung open a taxicab door and we jumped in he called an address to the driver it was chief leslie's home we were there within fifteen minutes lanagan held his finger on the button until the door swung open and the chief himself appeared wrapped in a lounging robe his hair tousled his beard rumpled but his gray eyes wide and alert lanagan brushed in and i after him he sat the chief down on a settee and for ten minutes he hammered away at last leslie's fist banged the settee arm by the lord harry you're right and i want to flash that bird again 
it all comes back to me now i couldn't make out the other day where i had seen him before little stouter but same man or i'll cut my throat he took the stairs to the next floor three at a time within five minutes he was back fully dressed got your machine out here yet yes said lanagan but don't forget the wards leslie stepped to the telephone stand and to his private line to headquarters prison he said shortly prison give me the matron mrs connis take that ward girl into your room and give her the best you have until i get down give me andrews sergeant andrews take that ward boy to the matron's room and give him the best you have until i get down there he's hung up the receiver come on we'll pick up brady he lives just around the corner we better get maloney too he's not far away if this is the bird i think it is we'll take no chances known as the swallow two-timer moyomasing prison porch climber came out here about fifteen years ago and reported on saying he wanted a chance to make good we kept track of him for a couple of years he was clerking and doing the right thing and then we lost him i didn't identify him that closely said lanagan but he's the man who did this trick and the other nine within twenty-five minutes brady and maloney were crowded into the machine with us lanagan gave a direction at pacific avenue and octavia street we stopped in the heart of the fashionable western edition with lanagan and leslie in the lead brady and i next and maloney bringing up the rear we straggled along for several blocks at washington and buchanan streets the chief and lanagan had stepped back and signalled us we closed up from the middle of the block on washington street came the sound of a taxicab starting leslie looked around the corner as the machine came towards us and stepped to the street flashing his shield the machine stopped the door opened a head appeared a familiar voice came hello chief what's up detective harrigan stepped out you're up said leslie with a bitter oath you are under arrest brady search the prisoner quick as a knife blade springs back harrigan's hand went to his hip but as quick as he was leslie was quicker there was a click click and harrigan stood before his superior officer and his brother detectives manacled with practiced fingers brady was running through his clothes he passed over harrigan's revolver handcuffs and billy he brought forth a leather wallet leslie tore it open it held an assortment of jewelry jumbled together so he said his voice shaking with rage you knew it was a swallow did you and you have been shaking him down for half the loot well officer harrigan you and the swallow will be splitting cobblestones inside of a month you dirty rotten gutter scut you were framing to send two little kids to prison were you i wish i'd let you pull that gun we'd have saved the county the expense of a trial he tore harrigan's coat back and ripped his star from his breast he ground it under his heel until the number it held was obliterated and then he hurled it spinning into the air and over the corner house it landed faintly on a distant roof harrigan noticed lanagan for the first time and sprang for him raising his manacled hands but leslie stopped him with a drive to the jaw that sent him staggering back against the machine take him in maloney ordered the chief i've seen enough of him we'll get along without you now harrigan said not a word he stumbled into the machine maloney following it drove away jack lanagan said leslie i wish you were on my staff you could have o'rourke's job tonight. thanks chief i'll be satisfied if you send o'rourke to the fog belt replied lanagan sardonically put a man like royan in his place and you'll have the kind of head the bureau needs royan goes said the chief you're entitled to something on this night's work we've got to hurry our man may have noticed that taxi incident i don't think so harrigan came out of the house we walked up the street take the rear brady said leslie and the detective stepped quietly down the cement path at the side of a fairly pretentious home leslie lanagan and i tiptoed up the front steps we stood to one side while lanagan took the door he rang twice footsteps came it was evident harrigan's host had not yet retired that you harrigan the voice came from inside before the door opened lanagan mumbled a yes the door swung back 
and donald cutting esq proprietor and general manager of the phoenix vacuum cleaning company stood staring at lanagan from the brilliantly lighted hallway for an instant he was speechless then he shouted well what the devil do you want around here at this hour of the morning what gets into you reporters anyhow has a citizen got any rights in his own home at all there aren't many that you have it was leslie he had swung to the door directly before cutting his revolver was at cutting's waist just keep your hands a little higher cutting you're pretty nifty with those digits of yours now back in there so we can all sit down and talk cutting stood an instant as though frozen and then mechanically stepped back we all walked in the door was closed swallow said the chief you're through we've got harrigan with the goods where's the rest of the loot i mean outside the robin stuff we've got that located cutting's head dropped to his hands he sat in silence bowed donald what is it is there any trouble a woman's voice came over the balustrade he straightened up as though an electric current had shot through him nothing molly he said just some old friends dropped in on me i will be at liberty soon your wife asked leslie my wife replied cutting in another moment she was sweeping from the broad stairway in a silken kimono her hair flowing loosely and stood before us cutting looked directly at her and in her eyes there was a light of questioning i must leave you molly he said still looking at him in that singular way she asked for how long it is not in my power to say these men are police officers they knew me from the east they want me to go down to the jail with them will you be there long if i could help myself i would not go at all oh she said with a nervous laugh i understand something possibly about that poor boy in your employ and that robbery lanagan's black eyes were studying the woman intently leslie was watching cutting both i could see were puzzled even i with my duller perceptions was sensible that there was some subtle undercurrent in this conversation something cryptic that i could not solve you will need your hat she said and turned to the hat rack in the rear of the hall it's all right chief said cutting in an aside arising you've got me please don't make any scene before her she returned with the hat and he fumbled with it kiss me he said she did so left his arms but came back to them a gush of tears starting as she clung to him in a passionate embrace go he said faintly his voice breaking she turned and stumbled for the stairs a quick look flashed from lanagan to the chief one minute madam said leslie sternly you had better come along too no cried cutting never chief as you are a man never in a million years she has never known of my work out here she knew me before my amazing she stuck by me during it all she married me and we came out here she knows nothing nothing she may have suspected but she knew nothing the old call claimed me going through those houses making estimates on cleaning why it's a disease that's all chief i got pressed for money i undertook too much in my business i couldn't handle it i had notes to meet i just fell naturally back to the old easy way that's all just went back to it because that's the way i was born i suppose crooked humph where did you send the stuff east except the robins and needed money bad didn't want to take a chance handling it here so i tried the message what harrigan didn't get is down at the office in the safe well, we suspected that said leslie how long has harrigan been cutting with you oh well uh, don't ask me that some time he's a wolf i am a crook but he's got me lashed to the mast the kid stuff was none of mine i did lose one ring at the office the boy found it he got scared and contradicted himself harrigan framed the other thing about the house well, i guess it's pretty nearly an even break said leslie he stepped forward to put on the wrist nippers as he did so cutting raised his hat to his head his hand coming down stopped for a fraction of a second at his lips better this he said rapidly backing away i couldn't go back i'm a pretty old man you know as though he had been shot through the heart he dropped in a heap 
Lanigan leaped for him. The chief bent over him. They arose together. Lanigan picked up the hat and turned back the sweatband. Inside was a little envelope pasted to the felt. It was half filled with white powder. Cyanide, said Lanigan. Such was the passing of the swallow. Lanigan, in his search for similar conditions in the ten burglaries, found but one, that Cutting had personally visited each house to make the estimates of cost. That fact, coupled with the ring found at his establishment, convinced Lanigan that he and he alone was the man. Cutting worked four machines, each with its separate crew, and no other employee had worked in more than three out of the ten houses. Anxious to keep track of Cutting after his theory began to impress him, he had learned that he was at the theater. He had picked him up after the show, trailed him to a café, followed him in a taxicab as he took his wife home, and kept at his tail lights when he returned after one o'clock to discharge the machine and walk to a saloon well south of Market Street, where he had met Harrigan. That was Lanigan's first definite information that Harrigan and Cutting were involved. Cutting and Harrigan had separated, Lanigan following Cutting to his establishment. He remained there some time, busied about his safe, and then apparently gone directly home. It was then that Lanigan picked me up. Harrigan, of course, was the man who had passed through the alley. He then had gone on out to Cutting's house for a final distribution of the spoils, Cutting having evidently taken Harrigan's share from the safe. Late that same afternoon, Lanigan sat in Leslie's office with Robbins, who had just received his jewelry. Robbins drew out his checkbook. "'If you will permit me,' he said to Lanigan, he had filled in two hundred and fifty dollars. "'How do you spell your name?' Lanigan laughed. "'Make it out to the Adams Piano Company,' he said." Robbins looked politely inquisitive, but asked no questions. He wrote in the name, but Leslie was not so polite. "'What in the name of Sam Hill are you going to do with a piano?' "'Nothing myself. I wouldn't take it any more than I would take the money. You know that. But there is a girl I know who can use that piano, and use it to very good advantage. And what's more, she's entitled to it.' He picked up the check and carefully folded it, placing it in his pocket. I'm going over now and pick out the best piano the money will buy, he said, and I'm going to send it with the compliments of Mr. Robbins, Chief Leslie, and Jack Lanigan to a little home at 211 Clementina Street. Miss Ward is the name. He lit a match. End of The Dominant Strain.